Hi friends, welcome back. So I wanna go over a couple things today. First, uh, there were some interesting lessons in Bloomberg from top investors, we'll go over that. And also too, I wanna go over some of your comments. Um, this is a comment I got a couple hours ago, but this is actually a very common comment that I get uh, quite a bit on the channel. And uh, this is coming from uh, so Rab, uh, Pop Pao Zai. And here's the question, uh, with all that being said, do you still believe there are some people out there online who are willing to help, for example, mentors and mentorship programs? Okay, <laughs> it's a complicated question. Um, first is you have a group of people out there who are searching for answers and searching for good advice slash mentor slash mentorship programs. My initial answer is most of the stuff on YouTube slash TikTok, they're charging you hundreds of thousands or whatever they're gonna charge you, it's pretty much scam. So I would stay away from basically most stuff online to perfectly frank. Um, I wanna dig more into this because I, I, guys, it's, it's a complicated question because you have to understand what is what is behind that. And essentially what it is, is, is there's a group of people out there and guys, I understand because I was there when I was young is to where you know you want some good advice and you want some good mentorship, but you're in an environment where there really isn't anything around you. And so the easiest access is to stuff online. Um, this is sort of why I wanted to go over something like this today. So my, my first answer is I read everything. I, I really do. Um, and this is one of the best ways to learn is, is by reading. Moreover, you can hang on this channel. I try to go over as much stuff as I can, but I can't go over everything. Um, the other issue is, is that this is just real. In a simple Google search or whatever, you know, it brings up your popular influencer people. And this person had an interesting comment sort of going over why uh, people fall for scams. And this is coming from uh, 18 hours ago from a film star uh, in the making. <laughs> it's a good name. And uh, the person says, um, these scams work because they appeal to people and they have five reasons. Uh, they want to get rich quick, right? So I agree, a lot of people out there like that. Two, basic greed, right? These are just basically what appeals to regular people these days. Uh, are fooled to believe you have to spend money to make money, right? So some people believe, well, if, if I buy the $1,000 course, therefore it must be really good because that person can charge you know, $1,000 or whatever. So I think uh, these are all interesting points. Another four, somehow think this is an investment and not a scam, right? So again, the person that's looking for the online mentorship, online programs, they, they kind of fall into this category of why you fall for this stuff. And here's another one. Um, they want what others have without putting in the work or making the sacrifices. And that goes back into uh, get rich quick kind of thing. So film star in the making had some really uh, good points. And, and guys, guys, this is sort of why I'm, I'm bringing this stuff up because yes, it's very, very hard to navigate the world. And especially if you're a young person this day, um, I'll point to my book. Uh, you can pick up a copy if you like. Um, the reason why, and I'll explain it really clearly. The reason why a book can say YouTube video is really different. A book is really, I'm challenging you to better yourself, uh, through asking yourself questions. Okay. Uh, yes, I do these similar things in YouTube, but it's just a different format and a different medium. And, um, if you take a look at say Warren Buffett's partner, Charlie Munger, uh, he said one of the best ways to improve yourself is reading. Uh, I'm using him as an example because he says, that don't just take my word for it. I'm, I'm telling you though, but my, my own personal view of this as well is just read as much as you can, not just my book, read lots of, lots of books. Um, or, you know, what I do uh, every day, I, I get up in the morning and I read all the news and I go over stuff with you guys. This is how I better myself. I, I learn every single day. And so um, for me, YouTube is fun because I do this stuff anyway. I'm gonna read this stuff no matter what and uh, I'm just sharing it with you. Um, and so, you know, if you ask, hey, Chris, like, who do you like on YouTube, et cetera? I, I don't really like that many people on, on YouTube, to be perfectly frank. Uh, you know, I don't need to listen to 20 year old kids who have no life experience and trying to sell me thousand dollar classes. Like, why would I, why would I do that? <laughs> and if you don't know, I'm, I'm pushing 50. I just, you know, I don't need to listen to 20 year olds. Um, however, uh, with that said, um, I, I do enjoy th this kind of stuff here. Um, this is again, coming from the Bloomberg piece and we'll go over it and you'll kind of see what, what it has to say. And, and I'll share some thoughts on this stuff. So it says Bill Gross, philanthropist and investor who co-founded um, Pacific Investment Management. Uh, we ran the world's biggest bond fund. So this is the lesson that he learned. Um, I learned an expensive lesson about dangers of leverage early on. Uh, in fact, I bought U.S. Treasury bonds with a 10 to 1 leverage, which is pretty crazy. A 10 to 1 leverage just months before my career at PIMCO began. I had 10,000 equity savings from my early experience playing blackjack. So I guess he's good at gambling. <laughs> um, from which I learned that any bet should be limited to 3% of your liquid net worth. I totally disregarded uh, that by buying 100,000 of 30 year treasuries, which within weeks declined and wiped out half of my savings. 
I would make many mistakes during the next 40 years in the bond market, but none as big percentage-wise as this one. Lesson. Gambling belongs at the casino. Investing requires prudent use of capital and void- avoidance of excessive leverage. So again, I just trying to answer your, your, your question is, is one is I, I learned from all kinds of sources and, and this is always good to learn from other people's experience, especially this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, 10 to one leverage is nuts. Um, moreover, yeah, uh, limit your, your, uh, you know, essentially you could say bet, limit your, um, allocations, uh, limit, uh, the amount that, you know, you put in one basket, essentially, um, don't YOLO all the time. And, and for whatever reason, we have this crazy culture and you could also call it part of the U.S. legal culture as well, where like it is legal to give people all kinds of leverage um, in the financial space. And then moreover, then people say, well, I mean, if I can borrow that much and, and you know, X equity is going up or X asset is going up, I, I better get it. I mean, it's already went up a thousand percent. I better buy more because it's the hot one. Right. So <laughs> that's what happens to a lot of people is, is you think the good times is, is going to go on forever and, and you over allocate. So, yes, that's a that's an important lesson for everyone. And, and I'm sure people out there will, will, will resonate with this kind of uh, lesson. Um, here's another one. This is uh, Ann Maletti. So this is head of active equity, All Springs Global Investments. Um, this is a good lesson. I like this one. Uh, trust your gut. In the early 1990s, I was meeting with a leading company in pagers uh, along with a very senior member of our investment team. The company was introducing a product that was going to change consumers by the character. When we tested it, came to a $300 a month for me and $500 for the senior team member. Okay, uh, here, here's the key. My gut and what I was learning about the company said that their subscribers could not afford even 100 a month, right? So their calculations were like 300 and 500. And she's like, you know, I don't even think they can afford 100. And it says here, we held the stock because I trusted the more senior person spreadsheet and numbers. I was young. I was, I was still learning the industry and doubted myself. I could have trumped the decision even though I was more junior, but I didn't. The company went bankrupt after two years. We sold it before then. It was a, but it was a brutal lesson. And this is actually a really difficult thing to, to do when you're young, because you're just trying to make it in the company and and keep your job. Right. And it may turn out like someone above you is either going with the wrong decision or they're overconfident, et cetera. And do you have the courage to say anything? Um, and, and, uh, this is a very real dilemma. Uh, sometimes, you know, if you're in a meeting for those of you who have these kind of jobs and, and the boss makes a decision in your you know, room of 20 people or whatever, right? Um, it, it is like really, really difficult to say, hey, I, you know, I got a thing to say, you're, you're wrong. Because um, oftentimes these older, more senior people just laugh you off and make you look like a fool, even though you could be right. So uh, I would say uh, one advice with this kind of situation, if you are going to do said thing, uh, make sure you go over your numbers very, very well. <laughs> and if, if, if you did your calculations right, you actually could be right and the senior person could be wrong. So um, that is a, a good advice and, and something to, to consider. I'd like to hear you guys' thoughts on, on that one. Um, here's another one. Uh, this is coming from Alex Pack, managing partner, Hack VC. Investing is a team sport and not the solo work of some mad lone genius. Uh, it matters who you partner with. Every Buffett needs a Munger. Every Horowitz needs an Andreessen. Um, so yes, uh, it is a team sport for sure. And, um, it's, it's never uh, hurts to get uh, alternate, um, opinions on things and never gets hurt uh, to, you know, look at the weaknesses of your arguments by just having someone you respect. That uh, doesn't mean you need like someone that's going to just shoot down everything you say just because they want to spite you. Uh, you want someone who legitimately wants the same goal as you, and you're looking for the best opportunities out there, uh, especially in, um, this is, this is kind of a problem on YouTube where, you know, everyone's all, all about, uh, you know, cheerleading said thing. Um, meaning that, you know, you guys know this, we talk about this on the channel where there's all these like pro Tesla cheerleading channels out there all the time. And everyone just wants positive reinforcement that their decision's right. Um, it's good to have, uh, uh, other people out there who can contradict you. And also too, Hey, if, if, if you're pretty sure on your numbers and someone else checks it out and look, the numbers look good uh, to them, you don't get someone you can trust as well. So multiple reasons why you don't want to just work by yourself. So that's a good advice. Um, here's another one. Uh, sh- this is from uh, Shuhei Abe. Uh, this is coming from the uh, Sparks Group. He says, in 2002, I pitched a well-known uh, public pension in the U.S. for a fund on Japan corporate engagement working with companies to convince them to change and boost value. I received $200 million of seed money, which I grew to about $3 billion, which is pretty good, of course. <laughs> um, the global financial crisis came. The pension fund pulled their money in 2008. 
and we had to dissolve the fund. I regret that I stopped the strategy I had been developing. We had investments where uh, the share price tripled a few years later and one that was bought, uh, bought out. We could have grown faster and become the KKR and a company of Japan. Today, corporate engagement is a very popular uh, strategy in Japan. This regret inspired me not to not give up on ideas and convictions that I know will play out. Uh, so yes, um, and I think this is a similar uh, uh, advice as the trust your gut kind of thing. Um, this is something that happens too. This is you know real. Is sometimes you actually have the right idea, but the timing's not quite right. Um, and you know, and that's that's hard. I mean, hindsight is twenty twenty. Um, you could be a little bit early sometimes, but uh, yeah, uh, sometimes you just really got to trust yourself. And again, it goes back to you know trust your gut. And I, I think the worst thing um, in in life is if you had a winning hand. That's a good way to to think about it. You know, and then you had the winning play, if you want to call it that way. And you know, looking back and regretting that you didn't stick with it longer. So that's that's part of navigating life too, because obviously you don't want to convince yourself that you are having on a sitting on a winning hand or, or a winning play, and that you're deluding yourself. So that goes kind of hand in hand with the other one of, of you need to have a, a partner that can essentially check your math, basically, and um, if you both believe in something fully. So uh, yeah, a lot of things to learn here with this kind of stuff. Um, here's another one, and, and again, your guys' experience is gonna be different than these people's, but. You know, the, the idea is you, you learn from each other and, and, and sort of know that you're not the only one out there trying to navigate this this crazy world. Um, this is from Christine uh, Philpotts, Portfolio Manager um, at Aerial Investments. Uh, she says here, uh, it's important to understand key stakeholders, including governments. Uh, for example, Nigeria's capital controls and Turkey's unorthodox monetary policy have pressured currency and liquidity for periods of time. We invested in Nigerian and Turkish exporters whose earnings benefit from currency depreciation. Um, but as U.S. dollar investors, uh, that depreciation and concerns about the inability to get money out of the country more than offset growth in earnings. Uh, governments in developed and emerging markets will not always make economic decisions in the best interest of stability and growth. And the magnitude of the dis dislocation is often much larger uh, than what investors forecast. So there's a couple lessons here. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll try to simplify this. Um, think of it this way. Uh, people aren't always uh, rational in the way you think they're gonna be rational. Um, and so essentially what you wanna be doing is like, okay, who's actually making uh, the decision and what interests do they have at heart, right? So here we're talking about, you know, um, but as a US dollar investors, that depreciation, the concerns, ability, inability to get money out of the country, more than offset the growth in earnings, right? So you know, like you have these people here that are like, it's saying here that they want to get money out of the country. That's what they're talking about here. So for them, that was like more important than maybe, you know, stabilizing the, the local economy, that kind of thing. So, you know, and it's like, yeah, it's like, you know, governments in developed and emerging markets will not always make the economic decisions in the best interest of stability and growth. Um, and that's why I, I, I phrase this kind of stuff as, as corruption. Um, but it's it goes beyond just that, right? It, it's just, as, I, as she states here, understand like who who holds the, the reins, I guess you could say. Uh, another way to think about it is, is well, and, and you know, we like to talk about the Elon Musk stuff all the time. It's kind of a fun one to talk about. But, um, you know, sometimes people would just be crazy and you have to accept that. And, you know, if you're gonna invest in said companies or you're gonna get involved with say Nigeria or Turkey, understand the world that, that you're entering. And so, yes, um, you know, as I mentioned several times on this on this channel, we, we look at numbers and stuff like that, but we also do want to look at look at people. And um, something that I'll just mention with you guys, when you're interested in doing business with anyone, always do Google searches, background checks on everyone that you're going to be associating with so you know uh, who's in the game. Um, here's another one. This is an interesting one. So he's a popular guy on CNBC. He always goes on there. Tom Lee, you guys know this is from Funstrap. He actually went to my school, by the way, but I don't know him personally, though. Um, I learned many years ago uh, what appears to be a positive for a stock does not mean the stock has to go up. It is critical to understand if the good news is already priced in. Uh, I used to be an equity analyst covering wireless stocks. Uh, I spent hours working on models and recommended stocks based on what I believed were companies likely to report great earnings. But often companies posting great earnings did not go up. I learned that it was how the news compared to investors' expectations. That's uh, been important to my view of the markets ever since. 
And um, this is actually really good advice for people who are, you know, uh, want to get into this financial space or, or you enjoy, you know, tracking stocks, et cetera. And, and, and understanding that, because like this happens to a lot of people, new people that, that, that enter this kind of stuff. And you're like, I don't understand why, you know, my, my favorite stock didn't go up or my company, like they had just had a great news, et cetera. Um, sometimes like, and, and we'll use the example of Tesla. It's always a fun one to talk about. Like if, if the price is, for example, if the price of their new technology, you know, full self-driving the robots, et cetera, uh, is, is like already in the price of the stock, meaning that people expect it to work. And then they come out with news that, Hey, it, it works. And then nothing happens because that's what was expected. Right. Um, and so this is sort of why you have to figure out, okay, uh, is there more upside or, or downside based on expectations of the market and what's already in there? And, and that's a tough one. That's, that's the thing that everyone always debates all the time. Oh no, this is the, this is already priced into the stock, right? We, we already expected them to make oodles of cash, et cetera. Um, you know, you're going to see every time they do earnings reports and, and they'll show like, okay, this is what the street wanted. This is what it came in, et cetera. Um, but, uh, yeah, this is, this is a, a, a great lesson is just because something has good news doesn't mean it's necessarily going to go up because maybe we already expected said great news. Um, it's, uh, really hard actually to blow people out of the water with completely surprising, uh, things, but it does happen, um, in a good way and in a bad way. I was just thinking about recently, the one that we watched, uh, was the, uh, New York's, uh, community bank where they came out with surprise to the downside of like, Hey, surprise, you know, we had a couple loans that didn't work out and we think there's going to be a whole bunch of other loans this is in the commercial uh, real estate space that don't look at uh, work out, et cetera. Um, but yes, uh, sometimes, um, even if something is, is news that you think it's going to go up, may not necessarily. So that's, that's good advice by Tom. Um, here's another one. Uh, Abby Miller, uh, Ali, Abby Miller, Levi, this is a primetime partners. I, I, I guess I should name my name. I should name him company primetime partners. This sounds funny, <laughs> but anyway, uh, she says here, or yeah, she says here, patience is very hard as an investor. The emerging area we focus on in our venture capital fund longevity is, is a new category. And new products and services often take longer to be accepted, especially in regulated markets like healthcare and financial services. We've learned to be wary of unrealistic claims of rapid market penetration or adoption and to be the champion business uh, that are must haves and solve urgent problems versus nice to haves. So that's kind of an interesting one. Like is a business a must have or a nice to have for people? And uh, I like this one too, the, the way she states it here. We've learned to be wary of unrealistic claims of rapid market penetration. Um, generally speaking, the venture capital space is highly, highly risky. Um, I actually have a close friend who uh, is always hearing pitches all the time. He's got a bunch of money. So <laughs> uh, this, if you're in that space, if you got a whole bunch of money and like people know you as the person who essentially the, I uh, would say money bags and um, you will fund anyone's dream everyone is pitching you stuff all the time because yes, you can make money in that space, but you can also lose money in that space. It's really, really um, risky. The other thing is too, is like everyone's always going to say the same thing, like, Oh yes, we're going to go to the moon and everyone's going to buy our product and stuff like that. So yeah, be wary, be skeptical of unrealistic claims because everyone actually tells you that, that it's going to be a big hit and everyone wants it. Um, but that comes with the, with the experience, right? And uh, oftentimes for, these kind of situations, um, you want to know what their business model is, but you're also betting on the person to whether or not they can actually execute it. Um, but I do like this way this to say, you know, is it a, is it a must have or a nice to have? Um, here's another one. And, uh, this says here, uh, William Bernstein, and this is coming from the, uh, uh, frontier advisors. Um, here it says, understand the relationship between investment capital and human capital. 45 years ago, I was a young neurologist whose human capital being in a secure profession was a relatively safe asset, like a bond. Uh, later in life, in the decumulation phase, stocks are very risky for you. Sequence of return, the possibility of hitting a bad stretch early in retirement, can sink even an overstuffed portfolio. In the accumulation phase, stocks are much less risky. It's impossible to be uh, too aggressive early on. I don't know if I agree with that, but uh, that's what he says. It is, it's impossible to be too aggressive early on since the investment portfolio is a tiny portion of your overall wealth, uh, investment capital plus human capital. Had I understood that, I'd be a lot wealthier today, though likely uh, not much happier. Um, the the thing I, I thought, uh, going back to why I disagree with the, um, it's impossible to be too risky early on, 
is that unfortunately, and, and, and this goes, and this is sort of why you want to get different lessons from lots of people. I was thinking about the one person who said um, they learned early on not to essentially YOLO and that don't over leverage yourself, right? And so like when this person said, you know, it's impossible to be too aggressive, I disagree. <laughs> if you go 10 to one, um, you know, leverage on, uh, you know, the riskiest assets out there, and some people do, um, be it your, your cryptos and your Dogecoin, something like that. Like I heard stories and you know, you always hear about these stories sometimes where like people are taking second mortgages on their house and stuff like that to buy whatever dog coin. And um, yes, it can work out if it works out. Um, but the, the joke for this kind of always stuff uh, is, is that it works until it doesn't. And so um, he's also making the point too about understanding like sort of where you are in, in your life is your, you know, work, your, your, your primary focus, or is it in, in your investments, right? Human capital versus investment capital. Um, but all these lessons taken together, um, I hope, hopefully they're useful. We'll keep talking about this kind of stuff on the channel. I, I like reading these things and just learning about other people's experiences and um, just hearing kind of the way that they say this. So that's, and this is something that I have to share with you. So like, why would you read different books? Why would you hear from different people? Even if it's the same kind of general advices, sometimes uh, you'll connect with different things, right? Uh, sometimes you'll be like, oh, okay, this person's from the city that I'm from, or this person, you know, had this happen to them in a relationship and it happened something similar to me and I kind of get, and, and you know, you're want to hear someone else's point of view and like how they dealt with said problems. Um, one of the things I, I appreciate all of you that come back to the channel all the time and, and, and guys, I read all the comments, you don't know. <laughs> um, I actually grow as a person from, from getting um, your feedbacks and, and your thoughts um, because I'm always trying to my best just to understand the world and, and the, the problems that people face and then try to answer as quite many questions as I can. And um, also to be really frank, I'm, I'm writing a second book and I always have so many things to say about this stuff. And um, you know, why would you write a book? Why would you read all of these things? It's, it's a, a very different process uh, than making a video because how can I say it's a hard it's hard to explain because right now I'm I'm just talking to you freely and stuff like that but when you, when you when you sit down and write a book I'm making lots of notes I'm doing lots of research I don't have to worry about like how I look on camera and like you know what the lights are doing or, or whatever it's it's a different process it's just about the the ideas and, and focusing on on that so if you understand what I just said there you'll kind of get why it's different mediums um, the other thing is too, is, is, is I can go back and recheck stuff that I said, it's not just off the cuff, which is, which is how I do these things every day of video. Um, I do it live. And, and the reason was too, I just want to just have a personal connection and conversation with you, but it's, it's different when, you, when you're right. It's, it's kind of think of it this way. Uh, it's like if you're at work and uh, someone says, Hey, you know, what's your thoughts on, um, you know, Sally and Rob's, uh, presentation that they just give and you literally just give your thoughts cause they asked you opposed to like, okay what's your thoughts on their presentation and get back to me in a year. <laughs> it's a, your answer is going to be different, right? Your gut reaction will be initially may be the same, but just the way you present it and the way, you, you know, more deeper thinking about it, it's just different that way. So that's essentially why you do a couple different mediums uh, in this space. So anyway, hopefully that makes sense. I do appreciate everyone's time every day and uh, catch you next video.